Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Nelson Eddy, Susanna Foster, and Basil Rathbone in The Phantom of the Opera with Edgar Barrier. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. A Broadway first night thrills the few hundred people who can enjoy the play. A Hollywood premiere is exciting for the few thousands who gather to see the stars. But opening night in the Lux Radio Theater belongs to the millions. The millions in American homes and camps from coast to coast. And it belongs to our boys in uniform beyond the seas who join us for the first performance of our 10th season. The real adventure is not in the lights or the crowds, but in the historic privileges of the theater, in hearing a famous star score again in a brand new role, and in the joy of discovering a new star. All that is yours tonight when we present Nelson Eddy and Susanna Foster in their new Universal Technicolor success, The Phantom of the Opera. And with them, in one of the theater's most interesting parts, we bring you Basil Rathbone. It's the first of a big parade of stars and plays that will challenge your attention and our ingenuity. Tonight's play has the thrill of mystery, the gaiety of comedy, and to stop everything else, one of the great singing voices of our day, the romantic baritone of Nelson Eddy. And if that isn't the right way to start the Lux Radio Theater off on another season, I don't know how to find it. We hope to make this season the best in our history, and we're counting on you to help us make it the best. By help, I don't mean just buying Lux toilet soap. I, I think you'll do that anyway, because you know how good it is. But backstage in this theater, we need your help in selecting plays. We want you to tell us what stars you'd like to hear. Everybody has a personal preference, and you give all the orders for our command performances. Your loyalty to Lux toilet soap has kept this curtain going up for nine years. Your reward has been a fine product and the finest plays and stars we could discover. And now, the thrill of another opening night, as the curtain rises on the first act of The Phantom of the Opera, starring Nelson Eddy as Anatole, Susanna Foster as Christine, and Basil Rathbun as Claudin, with Edgar Barrier as Raoul. <laughs> In the year 1880, the old Paris opera stood like a giant torch in the heart of the city. A thousand windows ablaze with light. But there were shadows, too. Shadows that flitted high in the gallery over the great stage. Shadows that lingered in the sub-cellars far beneath the street, where the black sewers of Paris ran sluggishly in the dark. But we were not concerned with these things, or so we thought at the time. We of the opera knew only the light of the dressing rooms the bright gaiety of the stage. I suppose it all began the night we sang Martha. The house was crowded, enthusiastic. There were no shadows for us that night. Je vous demande, mes chers amis, ce qui pourrait remplir la vie d'un tel immense plaisir. Vous verrez bien que la raison pour la gaieté de nos chansons, si plein de nos frais, de joie et refrain, c'est là le parterre. No, there was.
was no warning that night, no hint of the strange things that were about to happen. But I noticed at the finale that Christine was not on stage for the curtain call. Christine Dubois, who sang the role of Nancy. It was not like her to miss the finale of the act. Stage when the curtain had fallen, I saw Christine hurrying to her dressing room. Oh, it was wonderful. I never heard it so beautiful. Christine, Christine, wait. Yes, not at all. What is it? What happened to you? You weren't on stage. Why, well, I... You weren't ill, were you? Oh, oh, no, no. You're all right? You're sure? Of course, not at all. Do I look all right? Oh, you look lovely. What happened? Well, I had a visitor. Somebody wanted to see me. Oh? Mademoiselle Dubois. Oh, good evening, maestro. Mademoiselle. I understand that you were entertaining a gentleman backstage during a performance. Is that true? Yes, maestro. You are not the greatest soprano in the world, mademoiselle. Not yet. So you will please not take liberties. See me later in my office. Yes, maestro. Anatole, what will he do? Don't worry. He's just barking again. Who uh, was the gentleman? Well, he... He's an old friend of mine. But not so very old. <laughs> no. He's Inspector Dobert, the Sûreté. Inspector? You mean a policeman? Well, he's not an ordinary policeman. Oh, does he sing? <laughs> no. He's a graduate of the military academy at Saint-Cyr. How much does this man mean to you? Well, I- I'm not sure. Christine, it- it's not like me to preach. But someday you'll have to choose between your career and what's called a normal life. You can't do justice to both. I think you'll find that music has its compensations. In other words, you don't think I ought to have supper tonight with Raoul? Um, no. But if you want it all, that would be all right? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> we'll see. There was another man that night who missed Christine's appearance during the finale. His name was Eric Claudin, a violinist. He was a strange man, this Claudin. Quiet, almost shy, but a brilliant musician. When Christine came from Villeneuve's office, Claudin was waiting in the passage. Good evening, mademoiselle. Good evening, Claudin. Monsieur Villeneuve will see you now. Thank you, mademoiselle. Good night. Oh, mademoiselle, uh, may I speak to you for a moment? Certainly. You, uh, you weren't on the stage tonight for the curtain call. Everyone in the theater seems to have noticed that. It's really quite flattering. Why weren't you there? What? Oh, please forgive me, but I... I've been here so long that you, that... Everybody, everything connected with the opera is so much a part of my life. Of course. But Monsieur Villeneuve is waiting. Yes, you weren't ill, were you? You're not in any trouble. Oh, it's impertinent of me, I know, but... (laughs) No, it isn't. You're very kind. And I'm not in trouble. Good night. Christine. Monsieur. Oh, Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I shouldn't have called you Christine. I'm sorry. Good night. Good night, mademoiselle. Come in. Oh, Claudin. Yes, maestro. Close the door, please. You know why I sent for you, Claudin? I think so, maestro. I have brought my violin. Take it out of the case, please. Hey, Claudin, for some time now I have sensed discord in the violin section. It was not until tonight that I definitely located the source of the trouble. Now, let me hear you play, Claudin. Yes, maestro. What shall I play? Anything you please. Yes, maestro. Wait a moment. What is that? A little song. A lullaby from Provence, where I was born. Oh, it is very nice, very charming. I, I've written a concerto on the theme. Yes, I... yes, charming, Claudin, but too simple. Uh, suppose instead you let me hear the opening movement in the third act of Martha. Well? It's no use, maestro. Something's happened to the fingers of my left hand. I see. Perhaps it's only temporary, maestro. Perhaps it will get better. I hope so. In the meantime... 
I'm sorry, Claude. I'm very sorry. You've been with us a long time. Twenty years. What am I to do, Maestro? I know it's hard, but no doubt you've saved enough to retire on. Yes. Yes, of course. And in appreciation of your long service, I shall arrange with the directors to have a season ticket issued to you. <laughs> Thank you, Maestro. <laughs> There are things I can tell you now, things I didn't learn until months, even years later. Laudin had no money put aside. He lived in a miserable garret in the Paris slums. He was cold in the winter and often hungry. What money he earned was used for just one purpose, to provide singing lessons for Christine Dubois. She knew nothing of his sacrifice for her. It was a secret known only to Claudin himself and Signor Ferretti, the singing master. My dear Claudin, if you don't mind my saying so, you're a fool. Signor Ferretti. For three years I have taught Christine Dubois and you have failed. Why? How can a man of your age hope to interest a girl as young as... Signor, he... please. We agreed never to discuss my motives. Very well. So now you have been dismissed from the orchestra. You can no longer pay for her lessons. Is that it? Yes, Signor, but I... I hope that you would continue to instruct her. Uh, what? Just for a while. I'll have money soon. A concerto I've written. I've taken it to Monsieur Playel. It's going to be published. Yes, yes, I, I know. Every violinist has written a concerto. Then you'll go on with the lesson, Signor? Why should I? Why should I assume your burden? The girl means nothing to me. But her career means a great deal to me, Signor. More than anything else. I'm sorry, Claudin. Really sorry. I will uh, let her come a few times... Then I will tell her she no longer needs me. But that isn't true. Perhaps not. Signor, if you will give me just a little more time. You will have time, Claudin, when you have money. Come back when Monsieur Playel has bought your concerto. For weeks, Claudin haunted the publisher's office. But always it was the same story. Monsieur Playel was too busy to see him. One evening, just at dusk, Claudin forced his way past the manager, up the stairs, into Playel's study. Who's that? Monsieur Playel. What are you doing here? I've been waiting to see you since this morning. Didn't I tell you I was busy? Georgette, more acid, please. Is this the bottle? The blue one, dear. Pour it in the tray and be careful, dear. Monsieur Playel. This should be the best etching I've ever made, Georgette. Monsieur. Will you please be careful? Those trays contain etching acid. Would you like to burn the skin from your hands? I'm sorry, monsieur, but my manuscript. I must find out about my concerto. Georgette, would you mind giving the fellow his manuscript? You will find it on the table if it's anywhere. What is your name? Claudin. Eric Claudin. Claudin? I don't see it. No, 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 it wouldn't be there. It's a large manuscript in a portfolio. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't know where it is. Oh, but it must be here. Well, if it is, it'll turn up. You might call again in a few days. But you don't understand, mademoiselle. It's the only copy I have. It represents two years' work. You heard what the lady said? Get out. But it was brought into this office. It must be here. It must be found. Did we ask you to bring your manuscript to us, Claudin? Perhaps some employee has thrown it into the waste paper basket where it probably belongs. Good night. Listen. That piano. That's my music. Someone's playing my music. I thought I told you to get out. Thief. You stole on my music. Thief. Help. Let him go. Let him go. You stole on my music. Thief. Thief. <laughs> You're choking him. Do you hear? Let him alone. I'll burn you if you don't let him go. This is acid. I'll burn Thief. you. Thief! My work, my music. You, you, you. My music. It was mine. He had no right. You killed him. You! Ah! My eyes. My eyes. In that room, a man lay dead on the floor, and Claudin stumbled down the steps, screaming in agony, the acid burning into his face. Ah! Into the street he ran with his hands before him, groping his way blindly through the darkness. Ah! He was seen once on the Rue du Jardin and again in a dim street near the opera, and then he was gone, lost in the black of the night. Ah! There was a search, of course, but he was never found. It was not a thing that was close to any one of us. It was something you read about in the newspaper, shudder over for a moment, and then try to forget. In a few days, it was out of our minds completely, for Christine and I were rehearsing a new opera. 
One morning, we were sitting at the piano in her home. Well, that's very nice. What is it, Christine? It's a lullaby of Provence. Provence? I was born there, you know. I've known it for years, ever since I can remember. Sing it for me. If you like. Hear those bells ringing soft and low, bringing peace through the twilight glow, calling to everyone, night has begun, turn from your weary toil, Lovely, Christine. Christine! Yes, Aunt Bertha. Didn't you hear the door? Monsieur Dobert is here. Good morning, Christine. Raoul, good morning. You see, monsieur? They call this rehearsing. Rehearsing, huh? Well, I'm sorry to intrude, but I must speak to you, Christine. But, but you see, I- I'm busy right now, Raoul. Anatole has been helping me. Yes, uh, to rehearse. Yes. Uh, monsieur is very kind. Well, not at all, monsieur. I find it a pleasure. I'm Anatole Garon of the opera. Oh, I'm so sorry. This is Inspector Daubert of the Sûreté. Oh, the policeman. Police inspector, monsieur. Yes, of course. I've heard of you, Inspector. Your work must be very exciting. Oh, not half so exciting as yours, monsieur. It doesn't lend itself to (laughs) self-expression. Christine, I'd like to see you alone, please. I'm here on business. With me? What business could Mademoiselle have with the Sûreté? What is it, Raoul? If you don't mind, I'd rather Anatole stayed. Very well. Christine, do you know Eric Claudin? Why, yes. How well? Oh, I knew him as a violinist in the orchestra. Oh, I met him a few times in the foyer on the stage or outside the opera, but, but that's all. He he acted a little strangely. Strangely? How do you mean? Well, I, I don't know. He just he just seemed eccentric, but, but harmless. I thought he was a rather kindly fellow until I read of the murder. What is it, Raoul? Well, he was a kindly fellow until he thought Pleyel was robbing him of his work. Then something snapped, and he became a homicidal maniac. But what has all this to do with me? Well, we found something in his room, Christine, that connects you with him. No doubt you can explain. What is it? This statuette. As you can see, Christine, it's the image of you. So that's what became of it. Be good enough to explain yourself, monsieur. Certainly, that statuette is mine. Yours? Definitely, I made it. I intended to make you a present of it, Christine. How nice of you, Anatole. Unfortunately, it disappeared from my dressing room. Hmm. It's an extraordinary likeness. My compliments on your versatility, monsieur. Christine must have posed for this many times. I never posed for it, not once. You did this from drawings, monsieur? And from memory, monsieur. Extraordinary memory. Thank you. But it's a simple matter to recall Christine's face and figure. I'm sure you have found it so, monsieur. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. But what was the statuette doing in Claudin's room? He must have stolen it. It's obvious. Is it? Speaking purely as an inspector of the Sûreté, I'm afraid even the obvious needs confirmation. But as a man, monsieur, I'm sure you can understand. Sitting there in the orchestra pit night after night looking at Christine, Claudin probably fell in love with her. You admit that is possible, no? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Christine, did Claudin ever seek more than a casual acquaintance with you? No, never. Can you imagine so diffident a lover, monsieur? Claudin was barely 50. No doubt he lacked fire. No doubt. Christine, this statuette is yours. I give it to you. You give it to her? Yes. Well, that's interesting. (laughs) I'll accept it as a gift from both of you. Thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. Ah. It seems I have the worst of this bargain. In the future, Monsieur Inspector, I detect you model. In any case, that was a bad clue. Oh, not so bad as it seems. It enabled me to recover Mademoiselle's statuette. Is, uh, Is that your carriage at the door, Monsieur? Yes. Would you be good enough to give me a lift? Well, um, which way are you going? Oh, it doesn't matter. As inspector of police, I have business all over Paris. Well, in that case, au revoir, Christine. Au revoir. You've been most helpful, Christine. Most helpful. I I hope you catch Claudin. Thank you. 
Well, you ready, monsieur? At your service. Well, after you, monsieur. Well, after you, monsieur. Thank you, monsieur. <laughs> We could laugh then because the horror had not touched us. We didn't know that in the cabins of the sewer beneath the opera there was a shadow darker than the surrounding gloom. The shadow of a man in a black cloak, his face hidden behind a mask. This was the man whose features had been burned and whose mind was on fire. Before long, that shadow was to envelop all of us. In a few moments, Mr. DeMille and our stars, Nelson Eddy, Susanna Foster, Basil Rathbone, and Edgar Barrier, will return in Act Two of The Phantom of the Opera. One way you can be sure of having the last word in an argument is to have an argument with yourself, as this young lady is doing, for instance. I don't see anything the matter with my skin, really. It doesn't look as nice as it used to look. It does so. It's just that the light over this mirror is so bright. Well, doesn't Johnny Brooks always tell me I have a complexion like a million? Hasn't said so for a good long time. Well, he's been away at camp, Smarty, that's why. He's due for a furlough most any time now. Maybe you'd better start doing something about your skin. How about some real beauty care instead of that dip, dab, lick, and promise kind of treatment you've been giving it lately? Maybe I'd better. Yes, I will. I'll try those beauty facial screen stars use. Active lather facials with Lux Toilet Soap every single day. If it works for the screen stars, it ought to work for me, too. Well, she'll find it does work. This gentle complexion care used by 9 out of 10 Hollywood stars. You see, Lux Toilet Soap is a real beauty soap. With lather so rich and smooth and super fine, it feels like a caress on the skin. Lovely screen stars tell you they take their Lux Soap beauty facials this way. They smooth lots of the creamy active lather well in. They rinse with warm water and splash with cold. Then they pat their skin dry with a soft towel. Now, that's a very simple, easy care. But if you use it every day, you'll find that soon your skin feels softer, smoother, takes on a fresher, lovelier look. Why not get some Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow? You'll notice each satiny white cake is hard milled. That means it lasts and lasts. And remember, it's patriotic not to waste soap. Use only what you need. Don't leave your cake of Lux Toilet Soap standing in water. And be sure always to put it in a soap dish that's dry. And now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. Act Two of The Phantom of the Opera, starring Nelson Eddy as Anatole, Susanna Foster as Christine, and Basil Rathbun as Claudin, with Edgar Barrier as Raoul. There was a master key at the opera house, and the night we were to sing Amour et Gloire, the key disappeared. Other things had been stolen, costumes, masks, but now the shadow had entrance to 2,500 doors. He could roam at will from the sub-cellars to the very top of the auditorium, where the great chandelier swung over the audience. There were some who swore they had seen this shadow, flung on the walls of dim corridors, or crouching like a griffon on the high balconies over the street. And there were some who swore they had heard mutterings in the deep cellars where the sewers ran black. And tonight, so tonight, it is Amour et Gloire. Amour et Gloire with Anatole Garon and the soprano Biancaroli. Biancaroli sings tonight, not Christine Dubois. Well, we shall see. We shall see. It was strange the way it happened. In the third act, the libretto called for me to give Biancaroli a cup of wine. When she had drunk it, I thought for a moment that her face paled. She finished her aria and left the stage, but she was late for her next entrance. There was a wait, and then came the cadenza from off stage. 
I knew that voice. But it was not Bianca Rolli who was making the entrance. It was her understudy, Christine Dubois. During the second act, you saw me, Maestro. Madame Biancaroli, we realized If you, you... realized I was drugged, then tell that police inspector there to arrest the man who did it. We all know who it was, Zanato Garon. I know nothing of the sort, madame. I am a police officer, not a psychic. It is my duty to collect evidence without prejudice. Haven't you evidence enough? Everyone knows Madame, that... will you be seated, please? Monsieur Garon, is it true that you had the opportunity during tonight's performance to place the drug in Madame Biancaroli's glass? Certainly, Monsieur Inspector. We all did. It becomes, then, a question of motive. The motive is very simple. Garon wanted to get me out of the way to make room for that... Are you referring to Christine Dubois? I am. You heard, Monsieur Garon? Oh, yes. 
Madame is in good voice and most explicit. Have you anything to say, monsieur? I deny madame's accusation. Do you deny, monsieur, that you had any motive in drugging madame? I deny that I drugged her. Monsieur Inspector, I do not understand your reluctance to make an arrest. You are not an examining magistrate. Can you substantiate your charge that Anatole Garon had a motive in drugging you and that the motive was Christine Dubois? Why, anybody with half an eye would be able to tell you. Hearsay is not evidence, Then I'll go over your head. I have influence at the Sûreté. I was drugged tonight to the point of death, and I insist upon the arrest of the criminal and his accomplice. And if you don't... one moment, madame, please. You've heard Garon deny that he drugged you. As the inspector says, there is no evidence to warrant an arrest. If you insist upon it and fail to gain a conviction, you will find yourself in a very difficult predicament. Yes, quite right. And no matter what the outcome, don't forget that your career is bound to the Paris Opera. Whatever scandal injures us or any member of the company will injure you as well. Are you suggesting that I forget the whole affair? Yes, for your own sake as well as ours. Very well. That is under certain conditions. I want a new understudy. Christine Dubois goes back to the chorus and stays for the two years my contract has to run. No, I won't permit it. If any such arrangement is made, I'll go... My dear Anatole, I have not finished. I go a step farther. I suggest that we all forget that anything happened afterwards. For once, madame, I don't understand you. Oh, but it's so simple. Nothing happened tonight. I was not drugged. And Christine Dubois did not sing. What? Madame, there are always critics in the house. You will send word to the papers that no mention of her is to be made. You'll do nothing of the sort. It's ridiculous. Besides, what about the public? Shall we send word to the public to forget that Mademoiselle Dubois was a sensation? If you are willing to ruin the opera for the sake of Christine Dubois, that's your affair. But you'll either do as I say, or I will charge both of you with trying to murder me. Do you understand that? Murder! Ah, Madame Biancaroli. Good evening, Maria. Oh, Madame, you were magnificent tonight. Oh, my dress, please. You really thought so, Maria? Oh, yes, Madame. The best I've ever heard you. Especially in the part with Garon. The cadenza from off stage. it was so... Oh, you liked that, did you? Why, yes, Madame, it... Uh... Yes. Yes, I was very good tonight. My dressing gown, Maria. Yes, Madame. Ah! Maria! Madame! Madame. What's the matter with you? A man, madame. Outside the window on the balcony. Oh, don't be a fool. How could a man... Madame. Good evening. What do you want here? I'm sorry. I cannot let you see my face. You would not be pleased. Take off that mask, Anatole Garon. You do not frighten me. Madame, it is not Anatole Garon. I did not come here to frighten you unnecessarily. Only to tell you that Christine Dubois will sing. Tomorrow night. Oh, yes. You will leave Paris, madame. Leave Paris. You will see to it, of course. Yes, I will see to it, madame. Get back. Madame. Do you force me to reason with you, madame? I will not leave. Get away from me. I am sorry, madame. (coughs) I am very sorry. (coughs) Anatole. Anatole. What is it? Madame Bianca Rolli and her maid. They have been murdered. The opera was closed for almost a week. And then from somewhere within the darkened building, a note was written to the directors. Gentlemen, the opera must open very soon. Christine Dubois will replace Bianca Rolli who chose to ignore my advice. Good morning. Yes? Is, is Christine at home? Yes. Well, may I see her, please? Come in. I'll tell her you're here. Thank you. E vieni alla finestra, o mio tesoro. Beautiful, monsieur, beautiful. Oh, I didn't see you, Inspector. Good morning. How's the opera business, monsieur? Well, very poor at the moment. How's the inspecting? Very good. Splendid. Glad to hear it. Thank you. Not at all. (coughs) Good morning. Oh, good good morning, morning, Christina. Christina. Aunt Berta told me you were waiting to get her. Did you amuse each other? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good. May I Christine, have a word I with you? I wonder if I... Sorry, monsieur. After you, monsieur. 
After you. Thank you. What I was going to say... (laughs) One at a time, please. Anatole? They're going to open the opera, Christine. You and I are going to sing together. You are wrong, monsieur. I'm sorry, Christine. They are going to reopen the opera, but without you. Circumstances connected with the murder of Bianca Roli demand that someone else sing the leading role in your place. Really? You may be interested to know, Monsieur Dubert, that circumstances connected with the murder of Bianca Roli demand that Christine does sing. Well, the police have changed that plan somewhat. We are going to draw the murderer out into the open by defying his warning. My men will be posted at every entrance and exit. And probably miss him. (laughs) Monsieur... I am aware that your profession requires a certain self-assurance, but aren't you going too far? Not at all. I happen to have a plan of my own for trapping the murderer. So you've turned detective, monsieur? I have. Well, very well, if it amuses you. I might add that my plan is strictly confidential. All I can tell you is that Lorenzi is to sing the role, and I am not in the least interested in your plan. May I have a word with you alone, Christine? Yes, that's what I came for. May I speak to you alone, Christine? But I... I'm going out. Well, my, my carriage, carriage is just, just outside... I... I'm not going right now. I mean, I'm going later. I'll I'll wait. wait. Yes. Yes, we'll both wait. We were certain now that the murderer was Eric Claudin. The plan I had worked out took me to the home of a great pianist and composer. On the night before we were to open, I went to see Franz Liszt. Ah, uh, very nice. But do you really think this Claude uh, could be tempted to leave his hiding place and risk his life merely to hear his own concerto? Played by Franz Liszt himself, do you doubt it, Maestro? Now, my plan is for you to play the concerto be- between the second and third acts, and then... Well, when so they... many crimes have been committed in the name of music. It seems only fair to use it now to avert one. I am at your service, monsieur. Oh, thank you, Maestro. Uh, most exciting, this detective work. Most exciting. Well, it's more than exciting to me. I have the honor of being suspected of the crime. Gentlemen, I have been very patient. Now I learn that Christine Dubois will not sing. Gentlemen, if Madame Lorenzi sings in her place, you will be responsible. Two are dead now, only two. There will be more, gentlemen, many. Many more. Lorenzi sang that night. Through two acts we waited, and nothing happened. An old worker at the opera house thought he saw a figure on the catwalk leading to the dome of the theater. It was the old man's duty to light the monster chandelier, a great heavy thing of glass and bronze held in place by chains. When the police searched the catwalk high over the audience, there was no one there. We began to feel secure. Christine had come to the theater, but she was safe in her dressing room. When I entered from the wings at the finale of the second act, I was thinking only of the opera. Oh, 
chandelier begin to sway high above. It swung to and fro like a giant pendulum. Others had seen it, too. A woman in the audience screamed. <laughs> there was no time to get out of the way. The audience below was frozen, staring up at the monster of glass and bronze. And then it came hurtling down through space. <laughs> Get doctors. Doctors. Get every doctor you can find in Paris. Watch every entrance. Let no one in or out except doctors and the injured. Christine. Christine, where are you? She's in her dressing room. No, she's not in her dressing room. I've been there. I saw her, monsieur. She went down the steps. You saw Christine Dubois? Yes, monsieur. Yes, monsieur. She was going down the steps beneath the storeroom. I called to her, but she did not answer. Which way are the steps? Over there, monsieur. And there was a man with her. A man in a cloak with a mask covering his face. It's Claudin. She's with Claudin. Christine! Where are you? We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille presents Nelson Eddy, Susanna Foster, and Basil Rathbone in Act Three of The Phantom of the Opera. And now, our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins, with a fashion tip. Why, Mr. Kennedy, I thought our listeners would be interested in this little example of resourcefulness on the part of one of our famous stars. Screen stars must look chic and glamorous always, you know, but they're subject to the same wartime limitations as the rest of us. Take hairpins, for instance. Why, Libby, even a mere man has heard that hairpins are almost as scarce as nylon. <laughs> Alas, that's true, Mr. Kennedy. But Ida Lupino found some wooden ones that were lacquered and bright colored. Much too pretty to cover up, Ida thought. So she parted her hair in back, pulled it up on top of her head, and on each side of the part set a row of the colored pins to make a crisscross pattern. Look cute as could be, too. That sounds like Ida Libby. She's as smart and bright as Quicksilver. Yes, Mr. Kennedy. And she darts around Hollywood almost as fast. She has to, what with her studio work and the hours of war work she puts in. Not much time for beauty care, either. That's why she depends more than ever on Lux Toilet Soap for complexion loveliness. My daily active lather facials are such a wonderful beauty aid, she says. Busy women everywhere find that's true, Libby. Those Lux Soap beauty facials take just a few minutes a day. Yet the creamy lather gives skin gentle, thorough care it must have to be soft and lovely. Yes, a few minutes every day to smooth the rich lather in, and you can just feel your skin taking on new freshness and beauty. No wonder Lux Toilet Soap is the beauty soap of the stars. Reason enough why every woman owes it to herself to try it. 
Lux toilet soap is as fine a soap as money can buy. It's hard milled. That means it lasts and lasts. Each cake is satin smooth and fine. And if your dealer is temporarily out of stock due to wartime conditions, please be patient. He'll have more very shortly. Remember, Lux toilet soap is worth waiting for. Start your Hollywood beauty care soon. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. There's always excitement backstage after an opening. And you're invited to join us for a chat with our stars when the curtain falls. But now here's Act Three of The Phantom of the Opera, starring Nelson Eddy, Susanna Foster, and Basil Rathbone, with Edgar Barrier. Christine had gone with Claudin. The chorus that night had worn masks, and Daubert had arranged for the police to wear masks, too, so they might mingle with the crowd backstage. That was the way Claudin had enticed her. Thinking he was one of Daubert's men who had come to protect her, Christine followed him down the steps to the cavernous cellars. This way, mademoiselle. Hold tight to my hand. The steps are quite steep. Uh, are you one of the police? Where is Inspector Daubert? He's investigating the cause of the accident. I'll look after you. But why do we have to come down here? Why? Don't you like it down here? It's very lovely. Once you get used to it. Wait, please. Yes? Let, let me see your face. Take off your mask. Oh, no, 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 my dear. I must never do that. Never. You, you're not one of the police. Don't be frightened. I'll watch over you. I've always watched over you, Christine. No! No. No, you must not do that. You'll stay here with me, child, won't you? It's been so lonely without you. But you've come to me at last, haven't you? Sing to me, and I'll play. We'll be together forever. It's beautiful down here. Beautiful. Come now. I'll show you. Come with me. This is the last turn. Just through the tunnel. It's you. You're not frightened, are you? It's you. You know I'll not harm you, don't you? How could I harm you? I've always helped you, haven't I? Yes. Yes, once. You, you've helped me. Of course I have. Bianca in you. She wouldn't let you sing. She didn't know how much I love you. But now she knows. But it doesn't matter anymore. Nothing matters except you and me. Now you'll sing all you want to. But only for me. You will sing and want to, won't you, my darling? There's a piano in the opera for you. We'll, we'll go up there, monsieur. You can play it and I'll sing for you. But you don't understand. We can't go back ever. It was I who made the chandelier fall. I. For you, Christine. But I warned them. I told them there'd be death and destruction if they wouldn't let you sing. Oh, come. Come, my child. Isn't far now. Look there. Look. Oh. Didn't I tell you it was beautiful here? You didn't know we had a lake all to ourselves? Look at your lake, Christine. You'll love it. You'll love it when you get used to the dark. It's friendly and peaceful. Brings rest and relief from pain. It's right under the opera house. And the music comes down and the darkness distills it. Cleanses it of the suffering that made it. Then it's all beauty. And life here is like a resurrection. I came here when my face was on fire. I found calmness in that dark water. And comfort in the blackness over it. Then I heard you sing. I thought I died and that you'd come to me. And then the others sang and destroyed my heaven. So I destroyed them. You, you heard me from here? Oh, yes. Why, this is my, my private auditorium. Strange air currents circle these passages. They catch the music as it flutters down like a living bird in a net. You can hear the opera almost as well as from the highest balcony. I heard it. Yes, just as I heard it well, when I first came to Paris. You're not afraid anymore, are you? No, of course you're not. Then come with me. Come. Christine, where are you? Sure are. Bring a lantern here. Yes, Monsieur Inspector. Here, Monsieur. Christine! One day, take four men, search the passage to the left. Be careful now. Do you have another lantern, Inspector? This is the only one left. You'd better stay with me. We seem to have come to the end of the passage. No, we haven't. Isn't that an opening in the wall there to our left? Yes. 
Yes, it's a tunnel. Keep close to the wall. Feel your way along. There's just a narrow ledge. The sewer must run through here. There it is, just ahead of us. Do you suppose he might have doubled back? He might be upstairs. Why should he be? List will be playing the concerto. He should be starting now. Oh, yes, yes, that brilliant plan of yours. Christine! Look out! What's happened? I touched the side of the wall. The rock came away in my hand. The whole place down here is ready to crumble. Look. Look up there, just ahead. Yeah. It looks almost like a lake. Come on. Christine! 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 My child, this is my home. Furniture from this tall room, even a piano. Do you like it, my dear? You think? Come, give me a cake, my child, and then I'll show you where you will sleep. Listen! Do you hear? My concerto! They're playing my concerto on the stage of the opera! My concerto! I'll play it too, listen, child. It's for you. Yes, yes, for you. Do you like it, my child? I wrote it only for you. Who are you? Everything I have done has been for you. You understand that, don't you? Who are you? Take off your mask! No, child, no. Listen to that music. Listen. Take off the mask! I'll take it off for you! Why did you do it? Now you see my face. Oh, look at it, look. No, no. You'll never live here now, will you? You'll hate me. A loathsome creature. Hateful, repulsive. And I wanted you to love me. Don't come near me. But you'll see you've spoiled everything. Go away, go away. Christine, there he is. Get back, Christine, stand back. <laughs> you fools. You cannot kill me. Nothing can kill me! Arto! The wall! They're crumbling! They're going to fall! Come over here, quick! Look out! Get out in the passage, under the archway in the passage! <laughs> Christine, are you all right? Yeah. Inspector? All right. Slow down. He's still in there under the rock. My shot must have started the cave in. Come, Christine. We'd better start back. But, but Claudin... It's no use. It would take days to get him out. He's dead, Christine. It's, it's so strange. He said he said he wrote the concerto for me, a song I've known since I was a child. Who was he? He came from your district in Provence. Everybody there must have known that old folk song. He, he was almost a stranger to me. And yet, somehow, I I always felt drawn to him with, with a kind of pity and... And understanding. His suffering and his madness will be forgotten. But his music, his concerto, that will remain. Christine went on to a great career and great fame. The night we sang together for the first time, the corridor outside of a dressing room was jammed with admirers. I had to force my way to a door. Excuse me. Excuse me. Thank you. Anatole. Oh, you were magnificent, Christine. Incomparable, beautiful, a sensation. <laughs> Is that all? I've just begun. It would take days and years <laughs> to tell you how wonderful you were. We're having supper tonight at the Café de l'Opera. Well, I'm terribly sorry, Anatole, but, but I can't tonight. Why not? Have you another engagement? Well, yes. With whom? With me, monsieur. Oh, <laughs> that policeman? Inspector of police, monsieur. Well, how soon will you be ready, Christine? The carriage is waiting. I know Monsieur Garon will excuse me. How do you know? I have an idea. Why can't we three have supper together? Mm -mm. I am not in the habit of taking baritones to supper. And I don't care to be seen in public with the police. Christine, you'll have to make up your mind finally and irrevocably between the two of us. Exactly. Very well. Will you gentlemen excuse me? Of course. Thank you. Good night. What? What did she mean, good night? Well, something tells me, monsieur, that she has gone to meet her public. Hmm. Monsieur Garon, would you join me for a bit of supper at the Café de l'Opera? With pleasure, monsieur. Think we can get through that crowd? Certainly. After all, who'd pay any attention to a baritone and a detective? Quite right. 
Well, shall we go? Oh. After you, monsieur. Oh, no. After you, monsieur. A new season of the Lux Radio Theatre has had a gala launching. And the first curtain calls of this season have been beautifully earned by Nelson Eddy, Susanna Foster, and Basil Rathbone. Thank you, C.B. Our congratulations to you on the beginning of the tenth year of this theater. You remember what Tennyson wrote? Men may come and men may go, but the mill goes on forever. Or something like that. <laughs> well, my recollection is it was a brook. <laughs> but as long as we have stars like you three, I'd like to go on forever. Let's hope Lux Soap does the same. Mm-hmm. See, I really couldn't get along without it, Mr. DeMille. It's a wonderful complexion care. Uh, and Lux certainly cares for a lovely complexion in your case, Susanna. Thank you. Incidentally, Mr. DeMille, has Nelson told you about the chicken he has that lays the golden egg? No, but I like about a dozen. That'll be $120, please. That's pretty high for just ordinary old golden eggs, isn't it? Um, what kind of hens are these? Who dons? Who what? Who dons? They're a rather scarce breed. Someone gave me two hens and a rooster, and now they're all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> well, if the eggs are worth $10 a piece, doesn't it kind of choke you to eat one for breakfast? Eat them. Say, the hens won't let an egg out of their sight. They want to set right away. No, I hardly blame them. At that price, even a radio comedian wouldn't mind laying an egg. <laughs> uh, where, where'd the hens come from, Nelson? <laughs> Somewhere around New Orleans. I plan to crossbreed the Houdons with my New Hampshire Reds and see what happens. And when you become the Houdini of the Houdons, I suppose you'll give up singing. Well, the way those hens are eating now, I'm going to have to sing loud and often. <laughs> What's your play next week, C.B.? Well, it's a drama of adventure in the air. The RKO screenplay, Flight for Freedom. And our stars will be Rosalind Russell, George Brent, and Chester Morris. Rosalind Russell played the same part on the screen with brilliant success. A world-famous woman flyer whose career comes to a climax in a mysterious trip across the Pacific. So don't miss Flight for Freedom with the takeoff at our usual time next Monday. Sounds like a direct hit, C.B. Good night. Good night. Good night. night. We made music at the box office tonight. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Rosalind Russell, George Brent, and Chester Morris in Flight for Freedom. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. The Universal Screen production of The Phantom of the Opera in Technicolor, starring Nelson Eddy, Susanna Foster, and Claude Rains with Edgar Barrier, will have its New York premiere on October 14th. Basil Rathbone appeared tonight through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studio. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in next Monday night to hear Rosalind Russell, George Brandt, and Chester Morris in Flight for Freedom. Food shortages need not deprive your family of their vitamins and minerals. Just get Vims. They're new and different. Vims are pleasant to taste, whether chewed or swallowed whole. Vims give you all the vitamins government experts say are